Well, glad to welcome you to the Lupus Foundation of America Chapter Network's Let's Talk About It webinar series. Each month, our chapter network will be presenting webinars on important topics related to lupus from experts across the country. Tonight, we will, we will be discussing lupus and hair disorders. My name is Amy Yonder, and I'm the president and CEO of the Lupus Foundation of America Heartland Chapter. We're headquartered in St. Louis, and we serve Missouri, Southern Illinois, Central Illinois, and Kansas. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you that the information provided in this webinar is for general information and educational purposes only and is not a substitute for your own physician's advice. The views expressed by our webinar presenters are those of the presenter and not necessarily those of the Lupus Foundation of America. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and our presenter will try to answer as many questions as possible after her presentation. You can also chat with others in our chat section. If you have further questions or you want to learn more about upcoming education programs, support groups, or events in your area, please reach out to your local chapter. So now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter this evening, Dr. Amy McMichael. Dr. McMichael is a Philadelphia native who received her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She completed internship at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia and her dermatology residency training at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. Dr. McMichael has been a faculty member at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center since 1994. She's currently professor and chair of the Department of Dermatology at Wake Forest School of Medicine. She also served as the residency director at the department for 12 years. Dr. McMichael's clinical and research interests include hair and scalp disorders and skin of color. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology and a past chair of the Skin Color Society and the National Medical Association Dermatology section. We're pleased to have Dr. McMichael join us this evening and I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate the warm welcome and welcome to all of you guys today. I'm gonna to share my screen with you and um, hopefully this will work. Everybody seeing everything? Let's see. Let's go to the actual first slide and all right, here we go. So um, just uh, Amy, give me a shout if we are running out of time or we have any issues. So um, as uh, Amy said, I am from Wake Forest. I have had a hair disorders clinic at uh, Wake Forest for the last uh, 27 years. And I've seen pretty much everything that you can imagine that has to do with hair on the scalp, face, body, you name it. I've even seen hair in the throat after surgery. So um, I've seen it wherever it exists. So there's very little that surprises me. So hopefully I'll be able to share a few of my pearls today with you. I think lupus is a very complicated disorder. So, uh, you know, I'll try to keep it simple and we can go a, a little bit more complicated in the, um, in the questions. Here is uh, my uh, disclosure and conflicts of interest. I do a lot of consulting and a lot of uh, clinical trials. And so anybody who's interested in hair disorders, I'm happy to talk to them. So this is a group of people that I work with. I don't think there's much in this talk today that will be problematic. So, you know, what is this idea of hair loss and lupus? Well, um, you know, the first thing to know about it is that it can look like many things. You can have what we call both scarring and non-scarring form of hair loss and lupus. And when we talk about scarring or non-scarring, what we're really talking about is the hair follicles are either there or they're not there. And when they're not there, that's the scarring, okay? And usually what happens is white blood cells come up and attack the hair follicles and kill them off. And that's when we get the scarring form of hair loss. The non-scarring forms of hair loss um, can happen for a number of reasons. And we'll sort of go over those as we go through the talk. Um, so those are, but those are the two main sort of pillars, non-scarring and scarring. And the reason why we have those as pillars is because um, they really are treated differently and they're very different entities. So in terms of the non-scarring forms of hair loss, if you're talking about somebody who has known systemic lupus erythematosus, and now of course we all know and I'm not reviewing lupus tonight because that's not my role here, that lupus can be systemic. You can have just cutaneous disease um, or you can have both. Um, when you're talking about systemic lupus, there have been several um, patterns, clinical patterns that have been seen. Um, and one of my, actually one of my very um, dear uh, 
mentees or fellows actually wrote the most recent paper uh, looking at uh, hair loss uh, patterns in systemic lupus and it can include diffuse, that means all over the scalp, hair loss, patchy hair loss. So it's kind of, you know, just as it sounds like patches of, of areas which are affected in the scalp and what they call lupus hair. In other words, hairs that just don't look quite right when you look at them under uh, a significant um, power of magnification. Um, the other thing that we can see, and this may, be get to, may get to a little bit of the diffuse loss is that we can see telogen effluvium with systemic flares. So what is that? Well, when we have flares of lupus, everybody knows what that is, right? That's when um, your body may have been just kind of going along normally and all of a sudden your joints start to hurt or you start to have um, some renal uh, issues or complications, um, any kind of flare that your rheumatologist, your primary care doctor, your um, whoever takes care of you for your lupus, um, any kind of flare that occurs uh, can set your body into sort of a stress mode. It's not like stressful, I had a bad day yesterday or I've been in a pandemic for six months or a year. It's more like, okay, my body's trying to deal with a very significant problem and it's diverting a lot of energy um, into this issue. And what happens is hair is, uh, that grows on the scalp takes a great deal of energy. So when something else is going on in the body and you have to divert energy, it goes right to the scalp. It says, okay, we don't have to have hair. So let's divert our energy over to this other issue. And you'll see this thing called telogen effluvium generally around two to three months after some big um, systemic issue. And in this case, it would be a systemic lupus flare. Um, you can have localized hair loss, the, this, this shedding uh, around uh, what we call a discoid lesion. We'll see some examples of that in a moment. And you can have alopecia areata, true alopecia areata in patients with lupus because, you know, of course, we know that patients with alopecia areata and lupus can be one in the same. Um, because people who have autoimmune diseases can sometimes have more than one, or you can have these sort of patchy areas that look a lot like alopecia areata, but really biopsy out more as lupus. And then of course you can have the typical scarring discoid lesions of lupus. So let's um, go through that a little bit. Here's that paper that I was talking about. This is um, from the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, it was published in 2019. And this is from my um, mentee who is actually in, um, uh, where is he now? He is in Thailand. Um, he's from Thailand. He came and worked with me for a year. We did a lot of work together. We didn't work on this one together. This is all his own uh, doing. And it's a, a beautiful paper that looks at what we call tri trichoscopic findings. In other words, you know, we use a, a magnifying lens to look at um, the skin close up, we use it for moles and melanoma. We also use it a lot in the hair. Some people call it dermatoscope, um, but we try to use trichoscopic because trichoscopic means um, magnification of the hair. So trico means hair. So when you look at the hair shafts, you can see thinning in quite a number of people. You can see oftentimes short regrowing hairs. We see that the hair shafts are not as pigmented as they typically would be in a normal hair. And then if we look at the hair follicles, that's where the opening where the hair actually comes up through the scalp, you can see black dots, which usually means the hair is broken and you just see a black dot or a white dot. Um, sometimes white dots are little um, hypopigment. And unfortunately I don't have a, a ton of these photos and they didn't have them in the paper. And sometimes you can see right around the hair follicle, a little red dot, which is where these, there's inflammation and sometimes a little bit of blood vessel collection. And if you look at the skin surface, you can see blue-gray speckle pigmentation. You can see brown honeycomb pigmentation. You can see vessels that are kind of interconnecting. And usually we think of that as sort of a scarring process occurring. Um, and then sometimes you can see thicker vessels. So um, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you this so you can memorize all this and ask your doctor if you have it. But if you go to see a dermatologist and they're sort of wavering, you know, I don't know if this is really lupus or not, this is something that you can do before you get to the biopsy. We almost always do perform a biopsy, um, but this is something we can do. We can look at it with our magnifying light and oftentimes we have it attached to a camera. We can even take pictures and put it in the chart and follow progression. So this is something that I like to do because it's non-invasive, you know, don't have to cut 
or numb or anything like that. But if there's really a question of the diagnosis, um, a biopsy is going to be the way to go. So what clinically do we see? Well, if we're talking about chronic cutaneous lupus, so that's skin lupus, that's sort of a chronic ongoing problem, then we're going to see clinically follicular plugging. That means the hair uh, follicle is plugged. It's almost like if you had a stopper in a bottle um, and you looked at that little hair follicle, it looks like there's a little uh, stopper in the hair follicle. You often see scaling. You often see hyperpigmentation. In other words, hyperpigment, uh, the more pigment than should be there. Sometimes you see hypopigmentation and redness. And in this picture, you can see one of my patients that has a partial hair weave that is nicely covering the area. We can just flip it back and allows me to uh, evaluate the area as well as treat the area. And she has significant hypopigmentation. She has hyperpigmentation. Um, and you can barely see, if you follow my cursor, there's a few little areas where there's some um, follicular plugging. We'll see it a little closer up though in a moment. And you may or may not see this in uh, association with systemic lupus. Um, and, and of course, if there are systemic signs or symptoms that would, and you only have had up to now skin findings, that then points you into the direction of getting um, laboratory testing to make sure that there's no systemic problem, look at the rest of the skin, ask about the joints, et cetera. Um, because we, we don't know exactly when people are going to show up with the, with the um, uh, uh, systemic findings. Typically, you present with that first, and then your skin with the systemic findings first, but sometimes not. That's the, how it goes. Here's another one, one of my patients. She came in very late, unfortunately, to see me before, um, you know, so I couldn't really do a lot for her. So this is one of those uh, situations. This was the prior one where we see scarring, you know, so the white blood cells have come up and attacked the hair follicles and basically killed them off. And that's what damages also the pigmentation cells because um, when lupus attacks the skin, it does so at the epidermal and dermal junction. So the upper level and the, and, the, and the lower level of skin, right where those pigment cells live. And those white blood cells come up and they kind of just have a party and they damage the hair follicles, they damage the pigment cells and really damage anything they can get their hands on. Uh, they damage the blood vessels, et cetera. So here's a good example of hypopigmentation, a little bit of hyperpigmentation. And down here we see some erythema or redness okay and so this is this is pretty classic you know if you looked at this you might say oh this patient has vitiligo where you know you lose your pigment but she actually has hyperpigmentation and she has redness and also she has hair loss and in vitiligo it doesn't cause hair loss you don't get redness in vitiligo um, and you don't typically get hyperpigmentation so this is pretty classic for um, scarring alopecia so remember we talked about that plugging um, that you can sometimes see. Well, this is one of the best pictures I've seen. It's one of my own. I have to pat myself on the back because I, I don't know how I got this, but um, you can see there's like a little plug right in those hair follicles. Hair follicles are much bigger than they should be. And there's these little plugs here. Again, you see the hyperpigmentation, not too much hypopigmentation, maybe a little bit. And in this case, you don't see any redness. Um, but what we do see is that there's pretty classic follicular plugging doesn't happen to this degree in most other entities. So this should put you in the mind of, of uh, a, a chronic cutaneous lesion of lupus. Again, a biopsy is going to be the definitive way to figure this out. And with a biopsy, if you've never had one, we typically numb up a small area and we take about a four millimeter punch biopsy. So a little circular biopsy we usually take two, we take one and we kind of cut it, we bread loaf it and then we cut the other one the other way so that we can see how far it goes down into the fat. And also we can see what's happening at the top layers. Now, this is one of my patients, um, bless her heart. She had lupus um, uh, since she was a child. She unfortunately uh, did not win her battle with lupus, but she and her sister, both had lupus. And interestingly, her sister really only had the cutaneous disease. And after she got breast cancer, the sister got breast cancer, she got chemo and her lupus went away. So we were very lucky in that aspect. But unfortunately, this um, uh, young, beautiful lady um, had very significant systemic disease. Uh, and you can see, you know, that this, this looks a little different from the others. You know, you can see a little bit of scaling 
and you can see a little bit of hypopigmentation, but you don't see very much redness. Um, but what you do see is that this ear is involved. Now there's there's a few things that can do this, um, a little hyperpigmentation, scaling and redness of the ear. One of them is lupus and one of them is sarcoidosis. So generally when we see this, it's gonna be one of those two aspects or those two conditions. Um, but what she has is these very well demarcated, what we call annular, annular plaques. So what's annular mean? Annular means uh, rounded with a raised border. And that's also very classic for lupus lesions. And she didn't wish to take her hair scarf off that day, but you can see that it extended all the way up into her scalp. And so she covered her head because she had some hair loss um, with a beautiful scarf. And sometimes she wore wigs and sometimes she wore hats. And, um, but this is a very classic kind of finding. And I just wanted to show that cl classic finding. Here's another one of my patients with that um, ear finding. <clears throat> I actually just saw this young lady or she's a, a middle-aged lady, uh, not too long ago, I see her fairly regularly. And she has that hyperpigmentation and scaling right in what we call the conchal bowl of the ear. So that's a, like a little cheat area. So if you're not sure, um, if the doctor's not sure you have it and you have those little bowl involvement, the conchal bowl involvement, that's going to probably be lupus or like I said, it could be sarcoidosis. And then if you looked in her scalp, she had a pretty well demarcated um, area of hypopigmentation, still remaining a little bit of erythema. I'm gonna send, show you a little bit more of this lady because I think she's interesting. Um, we got her scalp under control and I'll talk about, you know, some of the treatments that we use for that. We, we did um, topical steroids in her. We did interlesional steroids. That's where we inject the steroid medicine right into the scalp. And we did um, hydroxychloroquine, which we've heard a lot about this year because of COVID. Um, but of course, that's an anti-malarial that is very commonly used in lupus patients. Got her very cleared up and we were on our way um, tapering her off of the hydroxychloroquine because she wished to do that. And she started getting these lesions on her cheeks and they first looked like acne. And I thought, wow, why is she breaking out with acne? We had not used any steroids, you know, orally. And the injection steroids don't typically cause this, nor do the topical ones, but it was her variant of lupus. And so she had this rare comedonal, comedonal means acne-like variant of chronic cutaneous lupus. Very few cases, only about 10 cases reported in the literature. And if you have something that looks like, a bit like acne, but it's not typical, you want to kind of think about this variant. Now, you know, sometimes you can just have acne and, and that's okay too. But if it comes and you, then, you know, you need to look for other signs of chronic cutaneous lupus, got to rule out systemic lupus, which we have done several times in my patient biopsy it, make sure that you know what you're talking about. And again, treat with animal layers, topical steroids. And we did just that. And she's actually doing quite well. She's even doing a little bit better than this because she's very, um, uh, very, uh, good about getting her chemical peels. She's been doing all the things cosmetically that we recommended as well as medically, and her skin is clearing up very nicely. Here's another patient of mine that um, had this, and it was not recognized for a long time because she, it was thought she had lupus, but if you look very closely, you know, it goes up into the scalp, it was on her ear, and she had those annular plaques, right? Those plaques that are circular with a, with a raised border. So you have to be careful. And I'm showing a lot of patients who have brown skin and you might ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, part of it is that um, lupus is more common in African-American women. It's the most common group to have it, um, but certainly men can have lupus. Um, children can have lupus, you know, um, uh, any, anybody of any ethnicity can have lupus. And as I said, that, that study that we were quoting was in patients from Thailand. And this is a, another, um, view of, you know, if you look at all the hair bearing areas, you know, and her brows, it doesn't affect her forehead, but right where her hairs are in her brows, it affected it, upper lip and chin. And, you know, again, something that is a little bit different, but we need to, to think about it when we see things that don't quite fit our acne profile. So <clears throat> what do we see when we do those biopsies? I was talking about taking the biopsy, we send them off to the pathologist. And what we see is this change. So this, if you can look at my cursor here, this uh, 
top here from the from the darker cells up is the epidermis and this from here to here is the dermis and then you start getting to the subcutaneous tissue this is uh, probably a little hair follicle of some sort being attacked and what you can see is that there's damage to this layer here you can see that there's white blood cells kind of coming up and trying to attack this layer and it's hard to see that if you're not used to looking at slides um, but we can see that and you can also see that there's um, uh, white blood cells down here around probably some of the vasculature, their white blood cells surrounding that hair follicle. And there's also something, this is kind of a blue color, it's kind of a, a bluish violet and generally is pink. It's supposed to be very pink, but in uh, skin and lupus patients, oftentimes you'll have a deposit called mucin. It's not always there, but when it is there, it's a good indication that you're dealing with lupus patient or lupus uh, condition, and it's uh, it causes the 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 stain to look kind of washed out and bluish, um, and then you can do special treatments of the biopsy. It's called a direct immunofluorescence, and you can man you can measure certain uh, proteins, and if they're there, that also gives you an idea that you're dealing with lupus. So what I'm trying to say is that um, you know lupus isn't about just eyeballing the patient. It's about getting the story, evaluating more than just the scalp, you know, look at the ears, look at the face, um, look at the, the area around the ears, use your dermatoscope because there are certain findings that we see in those uh, uh, with that and then um, move to a biopsy. So that's kind of the progression that we're, we're talking about. <clears throat> Once we've done all that and we've diagnosed you with, um, you know, chronic cutaneous lupus, um, you know, first we got to make sure we treat systemic lupus. Now, sometimes our our treatments will treat systemic lupus, but I often will uh, treat patients along with rheumatology. That's really my favorite thing to do. So we kind of co-treat. It's easiest if we use the patient, use the rheumatologist in our medical center, but I can treat with any rheumatologist anywhere um, as long as we have a good line of communication. And as I talked about, we often do use intralesional and topical corticosteroids. Now, sometimes you'll, you know, we'll pull out our oral corticosteroids for skin lupus, but that's very rare. Typically, oral corticosteroids are reserved for systemic uh, symptoms. Um, we do use a lot of antimalarials, though, and that's usually hydroxychloroquine because that's really the safest, um, typically most available antimalarial. When I was uh, early on in my treatment, um, early on my training, rather, chloroquine was used a lot more, um, but it's hard to get that now. Hardly anyone makes it, so we use hydroxychloroquine. And we do sometimes move to other agents. And when we do that, it's usually because the antimalarials are not working. So we use imuran or azathioprine, methotrexate, and cyclophosphamide. Um, we also use other, other drugs, oral retinoids. This is like um, Accutane. Sometimes we'll pull out Accutane because we find in some patients it can be helpful. We also use the anti-leprosy drug Dapsone. We use Dapsone in dermatology a lot because it's an anti-inflammatory uh, treatment. And, um, and then we use this other drug called thalidomide. And you might have heard about that many, many years ago when it was first pulled off the market. It came out first as a, um, as a, uh, a way to um, allow pregnant women or really anybody to get a good night's sleep. It was kind of a sedative. Um, but unfortunately, no one knew that it also caused uh, fetal damage in developing babies. So um, it was given to many pregnant women is primarily in Canada, and they ended up having babies with abnormalities. And so it was pulled off the market for a very, very long time. Um, but now it's put back on the market it was put back in market some years ago because it's actually a great drug and it works really, really well in my chronic cutaneous lupus patients. So um, when I can't use antimalarials, for instance, there's a side effect or complication um, or they can't tolerate it, they're allergic, then we can move to thalidomide. And it's now a federally regulated program, federally regulated drug in our country, not in other countries, but in our country in the U.S., so you have to sign up in the program. This is all to make sure that nobody who's pregnant gets it or that no one who's on it gets pregnant while they're on it. And it actually can be a very uh, nice drug to use. The only problem is, is that they've also found that it can work in some cancers. Uh, one of them is melanoma. And anytime a drug works for cancer, the, the price of the drug skyrockets. So it's actually 
um, costs pennies in a developing country and it costs hundreds of thousands of, or thousands of dollars in the US. So I'm, I'm told you that I would talk about these other ways that um, lupus can look and we'll spend a little bit of the remainder of our time so about five more maybe 10 more minutes on um, ways that lupus can look. And it can look like this thing called telogen effluvium. And, you know, people have probably had telogen effluvium. A lot of people on this call have probably, have probably had telogen effluvium and may or may not have been related to your lupus because telogen effluvium can happen for a lot of different reasons. It's one of the most, excuse me, difficult to diagnose alopecia is because it's constantly changing. If you see it in the early phase, you can have all over shedding, have just hair coming out in handfuls. If you see it kind of in the middle phase, it's kind of mild shedding. If you see it in the late phase, um, you may have very little shedding and only right here in the temporal scalp, right in the you know little temporal scalp there, will you have a pull test, but the patient will say, I really feel like my hair is thinned out all over. Um, you know, when I pull my hair back into a ponytail, you know, it, it's, it's much less, uh, you know, I have to wrap it around more times. Um, but most of the time people do recognize the shedding when it occurs. And we'll talk a little bit about causes. So many of the causes are listed here, starting or stopping medications, like going on or off of oral contraceptives or hormone replacement medications, iron deficiencies, thyroid abnormalities. After having a baby, a lot of people will have uh, this uh, form of shedding about three months or so after, um, significant weight loss or protein calorie malnutrition. When some of these fad diets come out, you know, we will see people just kind of going crazy with hair loss. There's been telogen effluvium associated with COVID, um, with actual having the virus, as well as just sort of being stressed, you know, long periods of time during the pandemic. And then lupus flares, of course, um, primarily talking about systemic lupus flares and then physiologic stressors like fever, systemic illnesses, surgery, general anesthesia, et cetera. So it's a really a big, big umbrella, but in the, in the lupus category, if you have lupus, then you may have what looks like this telogen effluvium flare. So we usually take a good history to make sure that's indeed what it is. Um, you know, if we don't have an identifiable event other than the flare that you're talking about, we will check a few labs just to make sure nothing else is awry. Um, but if those labs are normal and it really isn't a flare of your lupus, we might consider nutritional cons consultation because everybody thinks they eat really well, but most people don't. Um, so, so if it is your lupus, then, you know, it might be a hint for us to get a better handle on controlling your lupus. Sometimes, you'll be, you'll get a flare, you'll get it under control, but the hair loss will be delayed, you know, about three months after. So there's really not much you need to do. You just have to kind of grit your teeth and get through it. And what happens is usually about um, six months in, things start to really calm down. And then nine months in, you know, everything's stopped in terms of shedding, you're starting to regrow hair. And then by a year, it's much, much better. But it's, it's, it's tough to deal with it when it's happening, because it's very scary. Um, but, the, but it's one of those non scarring forms of hair loss. So as long as you get everything under control, you should be able to regrow the, that hair in those cases. Um, alopecia areata is uh, an autoimmune disease of the hair follicle. We see it in patchy uh, forms. You can see it down here in a patchy form. Sometimes you can see it in big, large swaths. Sometimes it's in the back. Sometimes it's totally total scalp. Sometimes it's the whole body. This young lady didn't have any eyebrows or lashes. And it can occur just by itself, obviously, but it can also occur in patients with lupus. So if you look down here, and you can see associations with classic autoimmune disorders. Um, alopecia areata happens in thyroid disease, vitiligo, um, pernicious anemia, which is like a B12 issue, uh, lupus, diabetes, et cetera. So um, alopecia areata comes out sometimes um, in lupus patients and it's you know, something that we can treat very aggressively because we know how to treat um, alopecia areata. Typically, it comes out in a patchy version. Um, and again, sometimes I'll biopsy because I want to see is it the patchy version of lupus hair loss or is it truly alopecia areata because we're going to treat it a little bit differently. If we see something called exclamation point hairs, if we get a positive pull test, um, if you get um, only dark hairs involved and the white hairs stay, that's all signs that it's truly alopecia areata and not, not lupus. Um, sometimes the hair will regrow in gray or white. 
and sometimes we'll see pitting of the nails. Again, signs that it's more alopecia areata rather than that patchy lupus-like hair loss. And we can treat, we can treat alopecia areata when it's patchy. Now, I have never seen somebody get this kind of severe all over alopecia areata and lupus. And so I don't think that that's typical. I think it's more typical to get the patchy variety that we can actually treat. And treatments will include, again, topical and intralesional steroids. We sometimes will use a systemic steroid. I typically won't use it in a lupus patient unless they're already on it for some reason. Um, we can do uh, topical immunotherapy. Um, I don't typically use this in lupus patients, but we can use minoxidil, and I do use that in lupus patients, so sorry. And um, we don't typically use anthralin or eczema laser um, very often. And now there's lots of new things to treat. Um, uh, alopecia areata patients. Um, this is sort of the breakdown. We've got these new things called JAK inhibitors, um, which are not actually approved for use yet in alopecia areata. They're actually approved in um, rheumatoid arthritis or polycythemia vera, as you can see here. I would not use those in my lupus patients because they are not necessarily approved for use and they could um, go against the rest of the medicine that you're taking. So while it's good for alopecia areata patients that just have alopecia areata or perhaps good for that, um, we wouldn't use it in a patient with lupus who has alopecia areata. I just wanna show you that. And there's lots of studies looking at these new drugs and there's lots of studies looking at drugs that are completely new, not even out on the market that are like these so-called JAK inhibitors. Now, oral minoxidil, I actually have to say I have not used in a lupus patient, but it is high on my list of use. You know, back in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we only thought about minoxidil as a topical. You know, you've heard of Rogaine, that's the generic, the generic name of it is minoxidil. So topical minoxidil foam, topical minoxidil solution. And we do use that in our lupus patients if they have hair loss because all minoxidil knows what to do is to cause your hair to keep growing. It keeps it in the growth phase. But sometimes it can be messy, it can be irritating, itchy. Um, and so people can't tolerate it. We actually have new, new data out of Australia, this guy down here named Rod Sinclair, who did studies to show in female pattern hair loss anyway, that low dose minoxidil orally can be helpful for hair growth. So it's something that you could potentially talk to your doctor about if, you're, if you've had some lupus related hair loss, they may be willing to try it. They may not, depending on um, what's going on in your hair. And they would certainly want to, you want to talk to both your dermatologist and your um, primary care doctor. Now, I've included platelet-rich plasma because it's out there and people ask me for every form of hair loss, do you think it will work? Um, again, zero studies that I could find in lupus for platelet-rich plasma. Let me just tell you what it is briefly though. It's where we draw your blood, we spin it down and we take the top layer, which is the plasma layer and has activated platelets in it and it's injected back into your scalp. So very natural because it's all your own, you know, parts of your own body. Um, it's used primarily for female male pattern hair loss. Now people are starting to use it for scarring forms of hair loss, but again, I haven't seen it in lupus patients. So while, you know, we are doing it, we need to get some more research on whether or not this is good for our lupus patients. It's very expensive, not covered by insurance, and everybody does it a different way. So right now, I think this is one thing to avoid um, when you're talking about lupus patients. Now, the final thing I'm just going to mention is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. And this is a collage of the various ways that it can look. It's typically on the vertex scalp or the crown of the scalp in women of African descent. But as you can see here, not all the time. And it causes what could look very much like a lupus related hair loss, not as much with the pigmentation, but you can see some, you know, hypopigmentation in some patients and some hyperpigmentation. In some patients have a little um, redness. So in the, in the case of whether or not this is CCCA, again, forming more in women of color versus lupus, which is also more common in, in women of color, a biopsy is really indicated if you can't tell the difference. And you can have both. I have patients who have both diseases and we treat both of the diseases. It's, it's common, um, but not super common. And uh, we have some prevalence data in, in South Africa and in the US, um, typically around 30, ages 30 to 65, but I've seen younger, I've seen older. 
and we do have some um, genetic data that uh, both myself and one of my colleagues from South Africa have worked on um, in this disorder. Um, but again, it can really mimic, you know, sometimes the, the, the patchiness of lupus. So want to make sure that we treat the right thing and that we know what we're treating. So I'm gonna close this off there because I'm sure there'll be some questions and just say that hair loss in patients with lupus can look many different ways and it can be very confusing. Hopefully I've clarified for you some of the ways that it can look and how we determine what you have and how to then go to treat it. You need to see a board certified dermatologist for diagnosis and treatment of this of this kind of hair loss because it can be very difficult for your primary doctor or your rheumatologist to figure out on their own. And um, remember, you can also get all the normal things that everybody else gets, female pattern hair loss, male pattern hair loss, dandruff, and lots of other common things, but it's not necessarily related to your lupus. It's just because you're a person. And uh, rarely do we find that lupus medications cause hair loss. So that's a good thing. Um, we don't typically worry about that. So I'll, I'll end there and thank you for your attention. We have great resources here for the North American Research, North American Hair Research Society, the Cicatricial Alopecia Research Foundation, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you also know about the National Alopecia Atta Foundation. And, and I'm sure that um, Amy can provide these things for you if you need them. So I'll stop the share and get to questions. Okay, great. I, I know we've had some questions. People would wondered if you'd be willing to share your slides. Can I get those from you? And mm, or is that not something? Yeah, not with the pictures. If they don't okay. mind just the words, yeah. I'm happy to do it. Okay, great. Uh, okay, we do have a lot of questions. <clears throat> so I'm going to start um, with the, the people that have posted in the q and I know some people have also posted in chat. So I'll try to get back and forth. But if you've posted a question in chat, if you wouldn't mind putting it in the Q&A, that would help me um, not have to go back and forth. Um, so uh, one, one person is just talking about having scalp pain and itching mm. and what mm -hmm. can be done about that. That's really a good question. I didn't cover that because that's a whole, you could talk about scalp pruritus. That's our fancy dermatology word for itching for two or three hours. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, lupus is one of the things that does cause scalp itching. Um, I, I've seen it in many, many different things. So uh, again, there, uh, it could be just your typical seborrheic dermatitis or dandruffy issue, or it could truly be the lupus. And if either way, um, a good place to start is a nice anti-dandruff shampoo, like one with zinc pyrithione in it. Uh, some people like the prescription ketoconazole shampoo, um, and those are really for the scalp. Now, the other thing that you can do is the topical corticosteroids that we talked about. You can use those in a variety of ways, solutions, ointments, oils, you know, uh, lotions, whatever works for your hair type. And generally, I'll use that for about a month to two months and taper it slowly. And if we've gotten good results, then we stop there. If it's localized because you have localized inflammatory areas, we can do the injections in those spots. So primarily, we're going to take down that inflammation that we think is causing the itch. Okay, great. Um, is it common for someone with SLE to have their hair turn white at an early age? I think you talked about hair turning white. Mm -hmm. Not particularly for lupus, but if they have a version of alopecia areata, that might be the case, or it might just be genetic. You know, you can, you know, when we have a, a chronic disease, um, you kind of always try to put everything under that umbrella, but sometimes it just happens because you're related to Aunt Sue or Uncle Joe, and they all turn, you know, white early. So it's not typical, um, but maybe if it's alopecia areata, you might, yeah. Um, I, there were a couple <clears throat> questions, people just concerned that if they lose their hair or they have scarring, can you get your hair back um, if it's mm -hmm. scarring? Yeah, so when we talk about scarring alopecia, remember we're talking about damage to the hair follicles. So the ability to regrow hair after damage to the hair follicles is really gonna be determined by how damaged those hair follicles are. And the lady that I showed with you know, the hair loss where she had almost all the hypopigmentation and very little hair, that's not somebody I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to bring hair back in because her hair follicles are so damaged. We know the pigment is damaged, the hair follicles damaged, we're not gonna do that. But in those localized little patches, I've been amazed at 
you know, these patients have uh, chronic cutaneous lupus with discoid, what we think of as scarring lesions. We do injections, we do aggressive um, topical treatments, and sometimes, like I said, we do hydroxychloroquine. Some of those small little patches can regrow. Uh, and it really just, it depends on where you are in the spectrum. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it, it, we don't always know, and it's different for every patient. Um, someone asked, do you see discoid lupus in the <clears throat> ear very often? Yes, very often. It's all, um, that's like a little, a little cheat area. Like I see it in the <laughs> ear. I'm like, ah, I know what you got. <laughs> so yeah, it's very common. Do you recommend a person with lupus related baldness see a dermatologist regularly? Well, I think it depends on what the achievement what the goals are. If you have hair loss, I don't like to say baldness because typically we don't see people with complete baldness. But bald, bald is a word we kind of avoid in dermatology. Uh, but hair loss, if you have re lupus related hair loss and it's not being addressed, yeah, I think you should see a dermatologist. And then you'll work with that dermatologist to determine what your follow up should be. <clears throat> is there a treatment that you may not be able to answer this because everybody with lupus is a little bit different, but is there a treatment for thinning hair loss with the medications that we're taking? For example, Nerzy Elixir vitamin formula. Is this okay to take? I don't know mm. what that is. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things on the market, um, you know, on the internet, Amazon, wherever you look that are, you know, the cure for hair loss. And, you know, I'll tell you what the three things that you got to watch out for. The cure for hair loss, the cure for overweight, and the cure for no money. Okay, those are where you're going to get the scammers. <laughs> so and hair loss right up there with the money and the weight. So you have to be very, very careful. I am um, a big fan of eating nutritionally. And I think that if you take the food that you take in, it's going to give you a lot more in the way of vitamins and support uh, for your overall health than any supplement. Now, I do have several supplements that I do recommend. I work with the Nutrafol people, and you might have seen that on my disclosure side sometimes as a consultant, but that is the, the um, hair loss supplement that has micronutrients that I recommend to folks who are having issues with, say, hair breakage or just unhealthy hair, maybe some shedding. I don't <clears> think there's anything wrong with that as long as it goes along with all your other medicines and your doctor's fine. It's not a prescription. They can get it on the over on the internet. We sell it in our office. So I think some supplements are reasonable, not all. And again, you need to talk with your um, with your doctor. And I saw that somebody just threw biotin in there. I'm going to answer that while we're talking because yeah. it's kind of along the same lines. Biotin does not help in any way with hair loss. Anyway, although it's all over the internet, helping it doesn't. And I would recommend you not take it because I used to tell my patients, well, it can't hurt. But now we know that biotin can alter the results of hormonal tests. So like your thyroid tests, um, if you had a heart attack, it can alter those tests, pregnancy tests. Um, it's really not a good thing to take. It can work for nails. And sometimes we'll give it to people for nails for like about three months at a time. But it, for long term, taking it for hair loss, don't do it. Okay. Um, can hair loss also be seen in Sjogren's? Um, you know, Sjogren's is kind of off the beaten path. I know people with lupus sometimes do have Sjogren's. Um, if you have a flare of any autoimmune disease, I think that, um, a systemic, any, any systemic autoimmune disease, you can have hair loss associated with that. But I don't think that typically Sjogren's is associated with any particular form of hair loss. So I would say it's not typical. Again, this will be a situation where you need to go see your dermatologist and say, you know, what do you think this is? And it may not be related, but you may have a hair loss form that needs to be treated. Um, there's lots of questions just about like over the counter, over the counter shampoos or, um, you know, any, what would you recommend if somebody doesn't want a prescription? Yeah. So over-the-counter products, again, if you have itching or scaling in your scalp, trying things like zinc parathione shampoos, um, salicylic acid containing shampoo, shampoos, um, tar containing shampoos, they can be helpful. Um, they're not uh, really treating the lupus, but they can be anti-inflammatory. So I think those are reasonable. They're good for your scalp. They're hard on your hair. So use them to your scalp and make sure you follow up with a nice conditioner because they're not really made for conditioning the hair. Um, 
in terms of, you know, things that you can get that's going to really be uh, helpful for the inflammation of the scalp, unfortunately, there aren't really things over the counter. Castor oil, coconut oil, you know, all these things. There's thousands of oils and butters and shea butter, and everybody wants to be natural. And a lot of those oils and butters will actually cause irritation in the scalp. So you have to be very careful. When people come and see me, I tell them, you only use what I give you. If you want to use something else in your scalp, you need to write me an email, you know, through your chart and we can decide whether or not that's going to be effective because I've seen so many people get burned with, um, you know, coconut oil and all these things that are quote unquote natural. But one thing, they're not regulated. Nobody regulates these over the counter products and they don't, they have fragrance in them. They have all kinds of other unadulterated chemicals. So be very careful about that. Now, if you have a stylist and you like the stylist, you trust your stylist and they're giving you things and recommending things and it's making your hair look good and you feel good, that's fine. Um, here's another question. Um, I have lupus. It's not aggressive enough to have major issues on my skin, scalp or joints. I have mild joint pain and some hair loss. And sometimes I feel skin eruptions in my eyebrows, mustache and under the eyes. Hmm. You mentioned that you suggested one of your patients get some chemical peeling. Do you recommend to get chemical peeling as a preventative approach? No, I do not. So the chemical peeling for that patient was simply because she had scarring hyperpigmentation from the process of the lupus. It was not in any way a treatment for the lupus. It was, it was really treating the cosmetic outcome um, from the lupus flare. So what you're describing though is an inflammatory process. We don't treat inflammatory processes with chemical peels except for acne, that's the only one. Um, so I wouldn't do that. I would see your dermatologist and just determine what it is that's happening. You know, it might be just something as simple as seborrheic dermatitis and you may be able to get away with doing an over-the-counter anti-dandruff shampoo or prescription anti-dandruff shampoo or hydrocortisone, but I wouldn't try anything until you go in and check it out. Can you talk about frontal fibrosis alopecia? Oh, sure. Frontal fibrosing alopecia, also known as FFA. I actually had that in the talk, but I took it out of the talk because the talk was already too long. <laughs> so the frontal fibrosing alopecia is a um, fairly new on the block form of hair loss. It was described in the mid 90s in Australia. Um, by dermatologists that saw it in postmenopausal women first, but now we've seen it, um, the, the, and it was very rare, you know, I would see it once a year, you know, twice a year. Now I see it every week. And it is uh, one of the most common forms of hair loss and the, at the uh, incidence of it is exploding. We don't know what causes it uh, to, to date. We don't have any causal uh, things to, to pick up one. It's not related to lupus, although I think somebody earlier said that they had both. Um, and uh, it is an inflammatory scarring form of lupus that affects the frontal hairline. So you get um, recession of the frontal hairline. It just starts going back and back and back and back and back. And uh, we treat it in very similar ways that we treat lupus, but it's really thought to be a variant of a disease called lichen planopilaris, which we didn't really talk about. So I don't want to get everybody confused, but yes, it's out there another process and we, we do treat that and we need to treat it, but, but we don't treat it very well. To be honest with you, I think I treat lupus related hair loss better. Um, what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of Nutrafol for hair growth? Oh, Does Nutrafol. It yeah. So I just yeah. I mentioned Nutrafol. So it is one of those, um, you know, micronutrient supplements that's out there. It's one of the ones that I feel comfortable prescribing for uh, recommending. I don't say I prescribe because it's not a prescription. I do recommend it for patients who have shedding um, of different types, who have breakage, um, it's not magical. It's usually an adjunctive treatment. In other words, I've got you on some main treatments and then we add this. Um, but again, this is very particular for what you need and for what you have. And it's something you should discuss with your dermatologist. Um, does taking hydroxychloroquine contribute to hair growth? Hair growth? Growth, yes. I'm so if you're taking hydroxychloroquine as a lupus patient who has hair loss related to lupus, then your hydroxychloroquine will control your lupus and allow your hair to grow, allow your hair to regrow. So yes, it helps with hair growth, but it's not a hair growth agent. It helps because it's actually helping your lupus be controlled. So it's very different than a hair loss agent. It's helping because it's taking down the inflammation that's causing the lupus. Can nutrition help with hair loss? Sure, good nutrition is always important. You know, I think there's nothing that you need to specifically eat or avoid. 
Um, again, you know, generally good nutrition, good healthy um, vegetables, um, and good uh, strong proteins. You know, if you're a vegetarian, you got to get those proteins in, um, and uh, fruits. You know, the, those are those are the mainstays of what your diet should consist of. You know, get rid of all the um, sweets and and things like that that we don't absolutely need. Um, let's see. Some of these I think you've already answered. Should I see a rheumatologist or a dermatologist with hair loss concerns? Hair loss is always going to be dermatology. There's no doctor other than dermatologist, a board certified dermatologist who's going to really get it. Um, you know, certainly, as I said, we work very closely with the rheumatologist and or your primary care doctor, depending on what you need. But the, the dermatologist is going to be it. You can certainly start the process with the rheumatologist or your um, primary care doctor, but you're really going to need to see a dermatologist, particularly one who's interested in hair loss. If my sister has alopecia and I have LS, SLE, should we check her for lupus too? Um, if she has alopecia areata and has been diagnosed with that, um, I don't think there's any reason for her to be checked. I mean, certainly, you know, if she has other symptoms, joint pain, fatigue, weight loss, you know, whatever, these are the symptoms that you can have, sure. But if not, you know, I think it's just one of those situations where you have autoimmune diseases in your family. She has one, you have one, you know? So I think that's what that is. Um, I've, several people are asking, how can they get in to see you as, <laughs> as a doctor? Um, well, I'll tell you, um, anyone can come see me in my clinic at Wake Forest. I will say that for my hair loss clinic, we're booking out a year. Wow. Um, so it does take a little while, um, but I'm happy to see anybody who wants to come see me. Okay. Um, What cause, does lupus cause your, your head to be tender? Uh, only if it's an inflammatory process going on at that spot. You know, I think I saw that and there's this, this idea of being tender headed, you know, where it's hard to comb your hair um, because everything just hurts. And there are some people who are just made like that. And I think their nerve endings are just really, you know, kind of active, you know, and that's, it, it's, just like anything, you know, some people are just made that way, you know, whenever you try to braid your hair or, uh, or, or de detangle it, it's, it, you know, it's a little bit sore. If that's something you've had all your life, then no, it's probably not related to lupus. But if you have an active lesion of lupus in your scalp and it's tender, yeah, sure. I think it can be cause tenderness. When searching for a dermatologist, do you need to find one who specializes in cutaneous lupus? Um, I think it helps. Um, we have a, a, a couple of dermatologists who like complex medical dermatology in our department, Dr. Joe Urizzo, Dr. Willie Wong, Dr. Lindsay Stroud, and they are extremely knowledgeable about all the rheumatologic diseases. And so I think it's nice to have that background. Um, you know, there are many excellent dermatologists who really don't do the complex medical derm. So you, you should make sure that when you call the office, you ask if that, that's something that they feel comfortable treating. Great. Can we color our hair? And if so, what products should we use? Yeah, I think if your hair shafts are normal and they're healthy, there's no reason you can't color your hair. And I would defer to your stylist. I'm really not a big fan of people doing their color at home, you know, unless you're you're someone you live with as a stylist, I recommend getting it done professionally. Um, and whatever products they use and, and are safe for your hair will be fine. So another question about hydroxychloroquine, it does not cause hair loss, correct? No, I've not seen that to be the case. Okay. Um, I've been complaining about hair loss to the wrong doctor. I should be telling my dermatologist instead of my rheumatologist, right? <laughs> right, right. That's right. That people tell me about their joint aches and I tell them to call the rheumatologist and people talk about their hair loss and they call, tell you to call the dermatologist. So yeah, we share, we share. Um, wigs are so expensive. Do you know of any resources for health issues, people who have health issues that need wigs? Yeah, so um, there are many insurances that will cover wigs. I usually write it as a scalp prosthesis and I use the um, 
the diagnosis code for the problem, you know, so if it was lupus, I would use the diagnosis code for SLE or chronic cutaneous lupus or whatever it is. And a lot of insurances will pay up to, you know, $400 even for wigs, you know, similar to the way they do it for uh, chemotherapy. Um, now, of course, not all insurances do that. And I don't know, other than for children, you know, uh, with uh, Locks of Love and the National Alopecia Areata Foundation, where you can get a whole lot of resources uh, for that. But, you know, there are so many um, hair uh, uh hair wig like wig places around now in most big cities especially and even in our small cities here in North Carolina you can get a really nice looking wig for like 50 bucks you know but you, you can't try them on right now usually COVID times but um but you you know 45 50 bucks you know if you can't try it on you can try it on and get home and you're not wasting a lot but you're right if you go get one of the really nice you know sort of human hair wigs they're going to run you a little higher than that but I suggest you kind of look around. Um, someone's asking if I, you know, if my lupus is under control, you know, I'm not enough flare, um, but could lupus still be causing scalp and hair issues even when my, my SLE is under control? Well, you know, if you have scarring hair loss associated with lupus, it's not going to go away when you're controlled. So unfortunately, the scarring forms of disease will um, cause the thinning. And it can just kind of stay that way. And I've also seen people who have had a lot of diffuse loss with lupus and they don't ever kind of regain it. Um, and I suspect it's because there's probably some scarring in there too. Uh, so there are, um, you know, variants of every type where, you know, if your lupus is not active, you know, all your hair will come back and it's great. And it's on a continuum all the way up to the opposite. So it's really very specific to the person. Um. There are still a lot of questions just about supplements and vitamins and, you know, yeah. anything in particular you, nope. that you're recommending. Okay. Nope. You got it. You guys got to get out of that, get out of that vitamin that, that, that's going to turn you wrong. You're going to be chasing the vitamin down the road and it's never going to help you. It's, and you don't even really know if what says that's in there is even in that vitamin. Correct. I and mean, they're not correct. really regulated. So, right. So that's why I stick with the Nutrafol. Some people like Viviscal. I mean, again, it's not really a lupus specific thing. It's more like a micronutrient. And I think those are reasonable to try. And if you do try one and it's, so they're not truly vitamins, they're nutrients. And I would, um, I would try for about six months because it takes about that long to see if anything's going to really work. Okay. Um, do low vitamin D levels affect your hair? Uh, probably, you know, we don't have specific data, but if you have low vitamin D, it's always recommended to get it up to the normal level because not that vitamin D has a direct, you know, tie to the hair, but because it's used in so many other, um, you know, different, uh, things that go on in your body, um, it can, you know, help just make move things along and have more healthy hair. So I would say yes, take vitamin D supplement if you need it. Can you spell Nutrafols for everybody? They're asking. Uh huh. N U T R A F O L. Okay. Nutrafol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my skin is dark brown. Discord has left me with all pigmentation gone on my nose, under my lip and ears. Mm. They're all just pink. Can that pigmentation come back? Not typically. You know, unfortunately, again, that was where the white blood cells damaged that pigment. And so if you catch it early, sometimes we're lucky enough to get it back. But it's not like vitiligo where we can start using light therapy and things like that. You want to stay away from light therapy if you have lupus because sometimes sunlight and those sorts of things can make your lupus flare. So in those cases, um, you know, things that you can talk about with your dermatologist are uh, things like dermablend makeup, which, you know, you can match to your color. I'm sure you probably worked through that. Um, and there are some micropigmentation processes that you can do these days now to kind of match your pigment. Those are hard to find. I don't do it, um, but some people do do it in, in the U.S. and it can look very, very nice. Um, again, you have to make sure you don't have active disease because I would never treat somebody with active disease with micropigmentation, but that is somewhat, somewhat, somewhat like tattooing, but it's a little different. Okay. Um, 
I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, is Revlimid versus thalamide. Which one's uh, better for cutaneous? Oh, okay. Yeah, we rarely use Revlimid for cutaneous uh, lupus. Okay. It's mostly thalidomide um, or thalamid. And um, so, yeah, I, that that's just sort of a, a, a thing about dermatologists. We're kind of on the thalidomide side of things. But I, in terms of what's better, if you need it for other things, I, that, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I can only tell you the skin stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what about chronic anemia and hair loss? Yeah, I mean, anything, you know, like we talked about that telogen effluvium can really be from a lot of different things, thyroid disease, chronic anemia. I mean, you know, you got to got to get all the parameters normal. Um, you got to figure out why you're anemic, number one, and and then, you know, treat that. And that's something that you and your primary care doctor or your, your rheumatologist can work on. But yeah, all that all that can play a role. Are there any clinical trials taking place for people with lupus and hair loss? Uh, not that I know, certainly not at our site. We don't have any, um, you know, that, that paper that I talked about was taking place that, that research took place in, in, uh, in Thailand. Um, I'm sure there are people doing lupus research. You can certainly always check, uh, clinicaltrials.gov and see what's out there. I don't, I don't know of any in my area or even that are active right now, but people start up new things all the time and they don't ask my permission. So you can <laughs> find out on clin clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, we're just, we're getting a little past seven. So I'm just going to ask a few more questions. Okay. Um, uh, is CBD oil re recommended ah. for scalp inflammation? Yeah, so CBD oil is, you know, one of the big question marks in dermatology is very little data out there, very little research out there really for any form of of skin issue. Um, the most that I've seen written about it has been for itching or paritis of the skin. And there's not a whole lot of data even about that to support or refute the need to use it. So right now I'd say it's very investigational. Um, it, it's, there's not a lot of data and um, that, was, that would be something you need to talk about with your doctor. Okay. Um... Does Imuran contribute to hair loss? I mean, there are a few questions about specific drugs mm -hmm. that cause hair loss. Yeah, you know, so some of these other, like hydro hydroxychloroquine, no. Imuran, maybe. Methotrexate can. Um, cytoxane can. So some of the more, you know, uh, uh, strong drugs can cause it. Uh, and, and there you have, to, you have to weigh whether you need that drug you know, because if you need that drug, you need to take it um, mm -hmm. and then weigh that against whether or not it's really contributing to your to your um, alopecia. So that's a question that I think is left up to how important is it that you stay on that drug? And can we do stuff? Can we do treatments while you're on it that kind of maximize the hair you have and the health of the hair that you have, despite the fact that you have to take that? If you can afford hair transplant, do you suggest doing that? Um, no, I don't because in order to do hair transplants, you've got to have great hair, uh, donor areas and, um, in, we never know where lupus lesions are going to occur. And so if you take, um, lesions out of an area, it could be then that the donor area is affected, um, by the, um, you know, by the lupus later on. So while the general answer is no, I have patients who have burnt out lupus. They don't have any, and they only have like a very small area that's affected. And one of my colleagues in Chile does hair transplants on those patients all the time, but it's really for people who have burnt out areas, they're, they're stable for two years, at least on medicine and willing to stay on medicine. And then they may be, be able may be able to get hair transplants into a very localized area. But when you have a large area, no. Um, several questions again about other uh, issues causing hair loss, like um, thyroid issues. D does mm -hmm. that cause hair loss? Yep, yep. How and it's a whole nother story. So, you know, <laughs> high blood, high thyroid levels, low thyroid levels. Thyroid is, is one of those things where we see, you know, that telogen effluvium hair loss, that kind of diffuse look, you know, hair loss that we talked about. And in that form of hair loss, um, when you have thyroid abnormalities, 
um, sometimes when you lose that hair before you've gotten organized, gotten your thyroid organized, it's hard to get that hair back. Um, but if it's early enough, some people will regain their hair. So um, thyroid does it all, in a lot of different ways. It's a little bit more than what we can probably address today because that's a whole nother story. But that telogen effluvium is going to be the most common form of, of, of hair loss we see in thyroid. Okay. I think that will conclude um, all the questions. I'm sure, um, you know, if you have something specific, you should speak with your dermatologist or your um, rheumatologist about that. Um, uh, we, we got through a lot of questions though. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I, I'm sure all of you, I've, you know, there's a lot of uh, comments here thanking you and saying thank that this you. information has been very helpful. So okay. thank you very much. And My thank pleasure. you all. Thank you all for attending this evening and um, look for um, future programs coming up soon. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.